Jill questions, Jill Furness. Here, here. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Go on, Jill. Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this house, I shall have further such meetings later today. Right. Jill Furness. Mr Speaker, last Thursday we received the devastating news that more than 350 steel jobs will be lost in Sheffield, Rotherham and Newport. Yet another blow for steel workers, their families and communities. When will the Government bring forward a comprehensive plan for the steel industry that tackles high energy costs, business rates and ensures that steel is at the heart of all public infrastructure plans? Action is needed now. Will the Prime Minister stay true to his word and repay the trust of communities that voted for him only last month? Yeah. I, can, I, I thank the Honourable Lady and I can assure her that the Government is indeed embarking on a plan to uh, do everything we can to make sure that steel made in this country does have all the competitive advantages that it needs. She makes some excellent points. In the particular case of, of Liberty Steel, I understand that all those affected, whatever happens, and it is a commercial decision for that company, uh, will be offered an opportunity to remain within the GFG alliance uh, by joining a new company. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. The, uh, cons the Conservative manifesto promises in relation to rollout of broadband and mobile phone signal are incredibly welcome. But would my right honourable friend agree? that rural constituencies like mine, wherever they are in the United Kingdom, should not be left behind? And would he agree that these vital technologies should be rolled out? And would he set a firm timetable for their rollout? Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, Mr Speaker, the Cotswolds needs broadband, and the Cotswolds are going to get uh, gigabit broadband, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're putting £5 billion into the rollout of gigabit broadband. And uh, he asked for a deadline. He will get it 2025, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I just put on record... Uh, could I just put on record our pleasure at the return of the Northern Ireland Assembly and hopefully the restoration of the peace process in Northern Ireland? I know there's a statement coming on this after Prime Minister's question time. Can the Prime Minister let the British people know why, after almost 10 years of Tory government, patients are waiting longer for essential NHS care, whether it's in A&Es, on waiting lists, or for a GP appointment? Uh, Mr Speaker, we are investing record sums into the NHS and I think indeed the House should be very proud today that we are passing uh, the NHS funding bill which will guarantee such funding not just this year but into the future. Well, passing legislation that will guarantee underfunding of the NHS, yeah. yes. Um, Mr Speaker, the number of patients waiting more than four hours in A&E &E, &E is now at its highest on record for the second month in a row. We've had months of promises, but people need action. There probably isn't a family in the United Kingdom which hasn't been affected in some way by cancer. Yet last year we saw one in four patients waiting more than two months for the start of their cancer treatment. How many more patients will face what are life-threatening delays because our NHS is understaffed and underfunded? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, as, as the uh, right honourable gentleman knows, there is a massive demand on the NHS, which as he also knows is doing a fantastic job, particularly actually in oncology, where tremendous progress has been made. He's right, he's right to signal the delays that people are facing, and, and they are indeed unacceptable, and that is why uh, we are investing in 50,000 more nurses. That's why we're investing in 6,000 more GPs, and that is why this government is investing record sums in the NHS. We will get those waiting lists done. 20,000 of those 50,000 already work for the NHS, actually, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> but delays in cancer treatment, delays in cancer treatment can reduce a patient's chance of survival. The target of 85% of patients to be seen within two months was last met four years ago in December 2015. Action is needed urgently. Last week we heard the heart-rending case of a 92-year-old RAF veteran in Leicester who had to go through the indignity of waiting almost 12 hours on a hospital trolley because there were no beds available. 
I want the government to apologise to him and many others, but to explain why, despite the extraordinary efforts of NHS staff all over the country, over 2,000 patients had to wait more than 12 hours before they could get into a hospital bed last month alone. Well, Mr Speaker, as, as he, uh, he's right to highlight the, the uh, case of the RF veteran. And I think everybody in this House will have every sympathy for people who have a bad and unacceptable experience in the NHS, and we all, we all share that. On the other hand, I would say that most people in this country, most patients of the NHS, have a fantastic experience of, of our health care, and we should pay tribute to our nurses and, and our staff. And the, the hospital he mentions, uh, the hospital, it, Leicester, is, is one of those which, as he knows, we are rebuilding under this programme. 40 new hospitals, uh, 20 upgrades under this Conservative Government. The a and &E has already been rebuilt in Leicester, actually, Absolutely, I understand yeah. it. And the problem is the Prime Minister promised 40 hospitals. In reality, it was 20, then it became six. Um, this, uh, Mr Speaker, this issue of people waiting in trolleys is a very serious one. The number doubled in December and now at its highest ever level on record. The Prime Minister promised to put the Conservative Party's inadequate NHS funding pledge into law. Can he explain why it is necessary to cement into law a pledge which the Health Foundation has said is below the amount needed to maintain current standards of care? Uh, Mr Speaker, it is only under this Conservative Government that we have the resources that will enable us uh, to invest in our, in our NHS. And it's because of the stewardship of the economy, after the wreckage that Labour left when they were in office, that we've been able to make those, those colossal investments. And I would, I would remind him, I would remind him, not only was it this Conservative government that rebuilt the A&E, as he correctly points out, it is this Conservative government that we will be rebuilding the entire hospital. And we are uh, in lesson. And we are, we are putting more money into the NHS as a direct result of our careful management of the economy. Well, I understand another hospital has been closed to pay for it, Mr Speaker. Um, the question is, why would the government need to put into law an inadequacy of funding for our National Health Service? There are, health professionals have said the NHS needs more money than the government is saying in order to keep patients safe. It's now been almost three years since the government promised a green paper on social care, and seven months since the Prime Minister himself stood on the steps of Downing Street and said he had prepared a clear plan to fix the crisis in social care. Well, what's the hold-up? Where's the plan? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted by his, uh, his constructive attitude, Mr. Speaker, uh, because we, do, we as, he, as he knows, we do intend uh, to begin with cross-party talks uh, to get to build a consensus. And I think there is a growing consensus in this country on the need to tackle the issue of social care, so that everybody has dignity and security in their old age. Nobody has to sell their home to pay for the cost of their care. We can do it, and we will do it with, with the help and cooperation of the Labour Party and other parties in this house. We will go ahead with a fantastic plan for social care. I look forward to his, to his support, but I would point out to him that it is thanks to this Conservative stewardship of the economy that we are now, and indeed the, the, the mandate of the people that we have, that we are now able to tackle a problem that was shirked not just by uh, the, the Labour Party, but for governments for decades after decades, and we're going to do it now. Mr Speaker, I don't know if the Prime Minister had a chance to read the Labour manifesto in the election, but we made it very clear. <laughs> We have a plan. We have a plan, a very clear one. It is, it is free personal care, it is more funding, and it is support for carers. And we're very happy, I'm very happy to send him another copy of our manifesto so he can read it. The Prime Minister has said, the Prime Minister has said many times he's going to put this NHS funding issue into law. But all this gimmick means is even longer waiting lists, more delays for cancer patients and more A&E departments bursting at the seams, while patients continue to suffer while he continues to provide excuses. If he's really committed to fixing the crisis his government has created over the last decade, he should end the empty rhetoric and back our proposals to give the 
NHS the funding it needs yeah. rather than putting into law an insufficiency of funding. The NHS is our most precious national institution. Fund it properly that everyone can rely on it, those that cannot afford private health care. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, he, I'm delighted he's still fighting on the manifesto that he submitted to the attention of the, <laughs> uh, of the, British, of the British people at the last election. I think it was pretty clear what they, they thought of it, uh, they th what they thought of the credibility of the promises uh, that he made. But it was also clear what they thought of what we're going to do, because they see that we are the party of the NHS, Mr. Speaker. They see that it is this government that invests in, in hospitals, in schools, in policing, in bringing crime down. And, it, and, that is, and that is because it is this government whose careful stewardship of the economy has led to record employment, record low unemployment, which delivers the tax revenues that enables us to pay for the whole of society. Whenever Labour is in office, Mr Speaker, they wreck the economy and they put unemployment higher and make us less able to pay for great public services. We're taking this country forward they would take it backwards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, despite the clear improvement in educational standards and of funding, white working class boys massively underperform at every stage of the education system compared to their better off peers. Given the exciting infrastructure projects on the horizon and the high value apprenticeships that will be unleashed, does my right honourable friend agree that reforming the apprenticeship levy, investing in apprenticeships will allow us to ensure that white working class boys climb the skills ladder of opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, apprenticeships play an absolutely vital part in, uh, in the progression of the, uh, of the kids that he's talking about and it is absolutely right that we should uh, follow his advice and he's been on this for, for quite a while now and reform the apprenticeship uh, levy and my right honourable friend the Secretary of State for Education will be updating the House uh, in due course on our proposals. Ian Blackford. Thank you Mr Speaker and can I congratulate all the parties in Northern Ireland for reformulating the Northern Ireland Executive. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker the Prime Minister sent a letter to the First Minister of Scotland yeah. rejecting the democratic right of the people of Scotland to have a choice over their own future. Mr Speaker, this was not a surprise. The Prime Minister is a democracy denier. Can I say to the Prime Minister, as his colleagues privately admit, this position is undemocratic, unacceptable and completely unsustainable. The Prime Minister has shown utter contempt for Scottish democracy, for Scotland's Parliament and for Scotland's people. Does the Prime Minister accept that by ignoring Scotland, imposing Brexit with his pursuance of cruel and punishing policies, that he's strengthening the case for Scottish independence? Mr Speaker, it was not only the right honourable gentleman uh, who leads the SNP in this House, it was also Alex Salmond and his protégé, Nicola Sturgeon, who said at the time of the referendum that it was a once-in-a-generation yeah. event. He said it, they said it, they were right then, why have they changed their mind? He is the denier, he is the denier of democracy. Yeah. Andrew Griffiths. Very good. Well, the question. Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's party, the Conservative Party, signed up to the Smith Commission yeah. that recognised the right of the people of Scotland yeah. to determine their own future. Yeah. That's the reality. The Prime Minister yeah. lives in a fantasy land, but people across Scotland know the reality of this Prime Minister's broken Brexit Britain. The truth is, the only union that the Prime Minister is truly interested in is his union with Donald Trump, yeah. a partnership that threatens to sell off our precious National Health Service. Mr Speaker, only yesterday the Prime Minister called for the replacement of the Iran nuclear deal with, as he put it, a Trump agreement. The public deserves the truth. What backroom deals are being done with Donald Trump? Why is the Prime Minister putting our NHS at risk? Repeatedly during the election campaign, the Prime Minister promised time and time again the NHS is not for sale. Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister now commit to supporting the Scottish National Party's proposal for an NHS protection bill? 
Without that commitment, what price will this Prime Minister make us pay for his toxic Trump deal? Actually, Mr Speaker, the the SNP welcomed our statement on the JCPOA uh, yesterday. you know, seriously, the, the, prob- the, pro- the, problem, the problem with, with the SNP, uh, Scotland under the SNP is the highest taxed part of the, of the UK. The deficit is six times the UK average. Maths and science in schools is actually going down in the PISA rankings. It's unlike any other part of the United Kingdom. That is no fault of the pupils of Scotland, by the way. It is the fault of the government of Scotland under the SNP for not giving them the chances they deserve because they are obsessed with breaking up the United Kingdom. Change the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Investment in superfast broadband is an excellent way of levelling up the whole of the United Kingdom, of boosting British business and of reducing carbon emissions. But could the Prime Minister reassure rural residents of West Sussex, many of whom have little or no access to broadband today, that the government's scheme to guarantee minimum broadband speeds is on track and ready to launch in March of this year. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend speaks uh, well for the interests of his constituents. He's absolutely right. And uh, as I said earlier on uh, to my honourable friend from the Cotswolds, of course we're rolling out superfast broadband, gigabit broadband. Uh, we have put five billion in. Uh, the legislation uh, is on track. And uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, gives me every assurance that Arundel and South Downs will be very well catered for. Research published this week by Oxford University shows that our oceans are heating up at an alarming rate and that is accelerating and it's going to lead to more incidents of extreme catastrophic weather. The government is on track to miss most of its environmental goals in 2020 and that record looks set to get worse in future years. Yet the government makes the right noises but fails to come to the right conclusions. So will the Prime Minister commit to legally enforceable targets and give the new Office for Environmental Protection powers to fine the government if it fails to live up to its promises? It should be the government that's under scrutiny, not the protesters that expose its shortcomings. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman is right to say that the, the new Office for Environmental Protection will indeed have powers to hold the government to account. That is quite right. But I would just, pay, uh, I just draw, draw his attention to the record of this Conservative government. Uh, because under this government, uh, what you have seen is CO2 down 42%, CO2 emissions down 42% on 1990 levels, in spite of a 75% increase, a 75% increase in, in GDP. 19, some, some days, most of our energy now comes from renewable sources and we will be leading the COP26 summit uh, where we will be introducing enforceable limits not just for this country but for the whole world. I congratulate my right honourable friend on his endeavours to get Brexit done but as he knows only too well there is something else that needs to be got done and in an exchange with me on the 25th of July he said that Southend would become a city. But before all that happens, will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the religious orders of Nazareth House Southend on their caring for vulnerable people over 147 years and meet with myself and others to ensure that their caring mission continues on that site. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to thank my honourable friend uh, for everything he does for uh, Nazareth House. I, I, I remember seeing personally when I was mayor the good work uh, that they do, and I'm very, very happy to uh, support that. And as for the citification of South End, uh, it continues. <laughs> Uh, at, at, a pace, at a pace set by my, my honourable friend. <laughs> Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are 1,200 people living with dementia in my old East and Saddleworth constituency, 850,000 across the UK. Today, dementia is the leading cause of death in the uh, UK. So will the Prime Minister commit to supporting Alzheimer Research's report recommendations to find cures and new treatments for all forms of dementia? And will he also support 
uh, out, the Alzheimer's Society has called to fix dementia care as a matter of urgency. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I congratulate the Honourable Lady on what she has done personally to support that campaign, and she's absolutely right to stress its vital importance for uh, this whole country. It's one of the biggest challenges we face, and that's why uh, we're doubling funding. And as my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, has said, we want to do a, a moonshot uh, effort to isolate the causes of dementia, to cure it if we possibly can. Yes. So Desmond Swain closed. Number eight, sir. I got it. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, a constitution, democracy, and rights commission uh, will be established to examine the broader aspects of the constitution, develop proposals to restore trust in our institutions and in our, how our democracy operates. Careful consideration is needed on the composition and focus of the commission, and further announcements will be made in due course. So, Desmond Sway, will he let bygones be top priority? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can tell him. I thank him. I can tell him that our independent courts and legal system are, of course, admired around the world. Uh, we will continue to ensure that a judicial review is available to protect the rights of individuals against an overbearing state, while ensuring that it is not abused to conduct politics by another means or to create needless delays. Sarah Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State and all the parties in Northern Ireland on the re-establishment of the Assembly? The press were briefed last year that the Prime Minister was going to bring an end to all ongoing investigations from the conflict, and he said on Monday that he wouldn't support vexatious claims when there was no new evidence. But of course the Stormont Agreement includes the uh, Historical Investigations Unit, and the point of all the ongoing investigations is that the original <coughs> evidence has never been properly investigated. So will the Prime Minister today tell us, yes or no, whether he now supports the investigation of every single outstanding claim. Mr Speaker, we will go ahead and, uh, and I, as I said yesterday, I think there's a good balance that's been struck in uh, getting Stormont going again between those who need truth and those who need certainty and the protection of our armed services. And nothing in the agreement, I want to reassure the House, will stop us from going ahead with legislation uh, to make sure that uh, no one who has served in our armed forces uh, is suffers unfair prosecution, a vexatious or unfair prosecution uh, for cases that happened many years ago when no new evidence has been provided. We will legislate to ensure that that cannot happen. Craig Tracy. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, staff at my local hospital, the George Elliot, have been praised by their bosses for the superhuman efforts that they put in during the Christmas period, which was not only their busiest on record, but led to them being the fourth busiest across the whole of the uh, West Midlands. So would the Prime Minister join me in thanking them for the amazing work that they do? And can you update the House on the progress of the NHS workforce plan? Uh, because this is key to ensuring that places like the George <coughs> Elliot are able to attract and retain the inspiration of people we all rely on to deliver our health care services. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I congratulate my honourable friend on everything he's doing to campaign for the George Elliot Hospital and his constituency, and I thank uh, uh, the staff there for everything that, that they do. Uh, the, the people plan will be coming forward in the spring, but he already knows some of the details I, I fancy. Uh, 50,000 uh, more nurses, 6,000 more doctors in general practice, and 6,000 more primary uh, care professionals in general practice. And today, uh, as he knows, the House is legislating uh, to ensure uh, that we guarantee multi-year funding, record multi-year funding for our NHS. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Rosanna, came to the UK as Kurdish refugee fleeing persecution and human rights abuses committed by Turkish backfighters in Syria. Her family remain in the area and she is in a daily fear for their lives. There have been multiple reports of human rights abuses against uh, Kurdish civilians in Syria, including uh, reports that Turkish forces used white phosphorus against children. Will the Prime Minister join me in condemning the human rights abuses committed by Turkish forces against Kurdish civilians in northern Syria? And what will his government do 
to prevent further atrocities. Yeah. Well, well, as she knows, we have raised our concerns uh, about the operation in uh, northern Syria with the Turkish government, with President Erdogan, uh, several times, and uh, we certainly deplore uh, any abuse of, of human rights or the, the suffering that she identified. Uh, can I make a pr proposal to the Honourable Lady that the, the, the details of the case that, that she has, I'd be very, very happy to, to look at myself, because I am deeply concerned about what's happening. Andrew Rosner. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the Prime Minister knows only too well, Britain is a nation of animal lovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And leaving the European Union will mean we can lead the world in animal welfare once we are decoupled from the lesser standards of the European Union. Will he commit the Government to make this his utmost priority in the months and years ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker. And I thank uh, my honourable friend for everything he does to promote and protect animal, animal welfare. And this is the government that is bringing in the toughest ivory ban uh, in the world, uh, bringing in new laws on animal, animal sentience, uh, cutting down on the illegal smuggling of puppies, uh, do dogs, and puppies. And of course, as we come out of the EU, we will now be able to ban the live shipment of animals, which has for so long been a disgrace and something British people have campaigned against. Whereas the Labour Party, the Labour Party is still trying to work out whether they want to rejoin the EU or keep in the customs union and the single market, so making any such reform and protection of animal welfare impossible. It's time they made up their mind. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister support T's MPs and Mayor in opposing the dumping of nuclear waste at Port Clarence in my constituency? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to look at the campaign that he identifies and uh, will be writing to him in due course. Hello, Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the Prime Minister's vision for an outward looking global Britain post Brexit, given Africa's huge potential in terms of te uh, trade and investment, could he update the House on the Government's plans for the UK African Investment Summit to be held next week? Uh, Yes, Mr. Speaker, I can. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady, who I know has followed these matters with great interest over, over many years. Uh, we will be having a, on the 20th, we will be having an, an Africa Investment Summit uh, here in uh, this country, and it will be a chance to show uh, people in this country, but also around the world, particularly in Africa, the huge commitment that this country has uh, to Africa, the massive investments uh, that we have in Africa, and the massive opportunities uh, this country has to strengthen those long-standing ties, bonds, and commercial relations. Lewis Chapman. Yeah, 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 Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Uh, the writer and broadcaster Muriel Gray said last week the end of the Erasmus scheme was an utter disaster academically, culturally, and socially. Politicians have voted to make our young people more insular, narrow, and parochial. I'm, I'm heartbroken. What would the Prime Minister say to 2014 no voters like Muriel, who thought the future of Scottish students was safe in the hands of a British Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid that the, the, the honourable gentleman is talking through the back of his neck. There is no. There, there, there is no threat to the Erasmus scheme. We will continue to participate. We will con UK students will continue to be able to enjoy the benefits of exchanges with our European friends and partners, just as they will be able to continue to come to this country. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, at the end of this month, on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the nation will come together once again to mark Hall of Course Memorial Day. The theme for this year is Stand Together. Will my right honourable friend commit to agreeing with the Holocaust Educational Trust who say that, welcome though it is, signatures in books are not as valuable as action. And will he commit to more action to stamp out anti-Semitism and all intolerance in this yeah. country? Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. I, I along with uh, my right honourable friend and others, will be uh, commemorating Holocaust uh, Memorial Day. Uh, and uh, we are, as he knows, in this uh, government, in this House, I think across the House, uh, wanting to do absolutely everything we can to stamp out the resurgence of, of anti-Semitism, which I myself, as someone of now 55 years old, I find absolutely incredible that the, the, in the 21st century we have anti-Semitism rising again in this country. It is a disgrace, and we must stamp it out. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. The uh, Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme affords a limit of 10,000 temporary visas for agricultural workers from abroad to come and work in the UK in support of food production. 
Given that my constituency of Angus requires 4,000 alone and yeah. neighbouring constituencies a similar uh, amount, isn't it clear and will the Prime Minister concede that 10,000 isn't enough even for Tayside, much less Scotland or the rest of the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Will he therefore instruct his friend the Home Secretary to take a review of this and in support of the National Farmers Union of Scotland and our whole agricultural sector commission that review to look upwards to a limit that will support the actual operational requirements of agriculture in our country. Yeah. Uh, I, I, actually, I think that the Honourable Gentleman raises a very important point, and uh, we have doubled the scheme, and we will make sure that Scottish agriculture, and the agricultural sector of the entire country, does have access to the seasonal work, work and, the, and the workforce that it needs. And I understand very, very well the point uh, that he makes, and that is why we are introducing a points-based immigration system that will enable this country, uh, enable this country, to get the skills that it needs. Child sexual abuse is not a thing of the past in this country. Last year, over 4,000 offences of online child abuse were recorded by the police, involving organisations like Facebook and Instagram, who find it easy to analyse our online shopping habits, but less easy to keep children safe. <coughs> Can my right honourable friend say how the government will continue to make it its priority to protect children from sexual abuse online. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, my right honourable friend raises a subject that is of massive interest uh, to this House and to the whole country, and we are indeed very concerned about what is happening uh, online. The Cabinet discussed it uh, yesterday. The online, white, white, online harms white paper uh, sets out our plans to make companies uh, more responsible, uh, but we will be taking further action in the near future to stamp out this vice. Edward David, can I thank all those involved in the important progress in Northern Ireland? Mr Speaker, when my mother was widowed with three young children, bereaved families received small payments until the youngest child left school. In our case, that would have meant payments for 14 years, except my mother died uh, too early. In 2017, these payments were reduced, the duration of these payments were reduced, and the new bereavement support payment was paid for only 18 months. Many of us thought that was far too short. So will the Prime Minister deliver on his government's promise to review the new bereavement support payment? And will he meet with me and charities helping such families to discuss how we can better care for bereaved parents and their children? Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. I know that uh, this is an issue which is very close to the uh, right honourable gentleman's heart, and it is absolutely right that we should provide people with easily accessible support following their uh, bereavement, and I will indeed commit to meeting uh, the right honourable gentleman. We're going to move on now. My word. <laughs> Point of order, Chris Bidwood. Mr. Speaker, you will have, uh, no Mr. Speaker, you will have noticed that it's um, become even more difficult to secure a seat on uh, this side of the House uh, following the uh, uh, general election, um, which reinforces the point I tried to raise in the last Parliament um, through a letter to the then Chair of the Procedure Committee about the need to have to take part in prayers um, in order to secure the seat. I find it, uh, as someone who uh, uh, no longer has a relationship uh, with, with, with God in a way that would be uh, uh, recognised by, by many, but those of us who don't have uh, faith um, or subscribe to faith other than the established church are required to take part in, uh, in, in prayers in order to secure a place. There is the possibility of putting a pink card in with committee written on it, and quite rightly today the doorkeepers, because there aren't any committees yet formed, declined to make a pink card available to me. Mr Speaker, um, could you ask the uh, doorkeepers um, in advance of the committees being formed, for those of us who don't want to take part and don't want to have to sit during, uh, during prayers, uh, um, uh, in order to secure a place available, and could you also ask the procedure committee um, to look again at this issue in the next parliament so that those of us who find this uncomfortable aren't placed in this position? First of all, I have sympathy. I know what it was like in 97. Well, I would say is <laughs> that the pink card system is something that the House has chosen to do when committees are sitting, committees are not, and I will not instruct the doorkeepers to do something against what is procedure of this House. Well, I would say is, and he's quite right, I think the matter needs to be taken up with the Procedure Committee, and I'm sure he will continue to do so. Point forward, Tony. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And apologies, I wasn't able to give you more notice of, the, of, of my point of order. But it's come to light that a newly elected member of this House has misled the press about his involvement in an exploitative and demeaning website called SugarDaddy.net. Now, the honourable member from Bridgend's involvement was highlighted following press reports about complaints to Bridgend trading standards. Links to the website were denied on the record by.